Welcome. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Sorry for the technical difficulties, our delay in starting. Uh, I'm Viola Vanderroot, advisor with National Bank Financial, and this month we're presenting another special presentation by Jocelyn Duncan, who is vice president with Franklin Templeton. Some of you may have already seen Jocelyn in our January presentation that she did of Uncharted Waters. And many of you, of course, are very familiar with the Templeton name because it's one of the oldest names in investments um, in Canada and North America for that matter. Um, but Jocelyn's also very active within the business community in Victoria as a mentor to students at the um, UVic Gustafson School of Business. And I'm going to now pass it over to Jocelyn to um, get started with this presentation today. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Viola. It's uh, always a pleasure to present um, and work with your team and present to your clients. I cannot believe it was January that we were last together. That just kind of shows how COVID time flies. And um, that's a good segue into our presentation today because you remember when you were in your 20s, everybody, and um, your parents or your grandparents told you it's just like you just wait one day you're going to be in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and and you think at that time that you know it's it's never going to happen, and then boof, there you are. And you know, for a lot of people, thinking about aging um, turns us to think a lot about loss. You know, losing loved ones or friends or even things like control of your finances or um, you know, your health and all of this, but aging doesn't have to be that scary. And in fact, there's a lot of things and little changes and tweaks you can do to, to your everyday life to help you, you know, what I like to call age with dignity. And so we can reverse some of these fears. And so aging really encompasses everything in our lives. And uh, we love, a good acronym in, in our industry. And so we're gonna to talk today about staying sharp. And by staying sharp, I don't mean cognitively sharp, although that's part of it. But when we're gonna talk about staying sharp, we're gonna talk about staying safe and healthy and alert and resilient and prepared. And so joining us for our little journey today is um, a baseball legend, Yogi Berra. Uh, Probably many of you have heard from him. He was a baseball legend, but he was also known for some of his witty little anecdotes. And um, he's also been known as kind of a philosopher. So, you know, for instance, one of his great things, you've got to be careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Very profound. So he's going to join us on our little journey today. And in honor of Yogi, we're going to start with staying safe at home. And again, baseball fans will get that one. And the reason we're starting here is because when you talk to many seniors, um, overwhelmingly, they hope that they will be able to stay in their home um, for as long as possible, uh, if not indefinitely. You know, 93% of Canadians over the age of 65 are still living in their homes. However, Many people um, have accidents in their homes and falls are, do remain the leading cause of injuries and hospitalizations among Canadian seniors. And sadly, for those hospitalized, uh, the majority remain in hospital for over a week and with things like hip fractures and sometimes it can lead to death. And then unfortunately, once there's a fall, more than one in three seniors end up not being able to go back home but are end up being dislodged into long-term care. So what are some of the things that we can do to be safe at home? Well, of course you think about an annual checkup, but when we think about annual checkups, it's like blood pressure, heart, um, all of those things, but there's actually ways that you can have your doctor test you for things, um, muscle strength, balance, um, look at your gait to see uh, if you're walking properly. And, also, we always tell people to get moving, but there's very specific type of exercises that can help with balance. Um, tai Chi and yoga uh, that can help. You know, and you think about things around yourself too. I know um, a few years back, my mom was walking out of a uh, laundry room at home and there was a, like a washer hose just across like why the entranceway, she chipped, boom, broke her shoulder. You know, that was just one little 
accident that could have been avoided just by clearing hallways and doorways and clutter around your house. And also doing minor things to remodel your homes, putting bars in your shower or, you know, helping you if you're able to say get off the toilet or making sure surfaces are not slippery or putting in light sensors. So when you're walking in a dark hallway, things automatically light up. And so, you know, falls aren't inevitable. You know, most are prevent preventable. Do you ever see those commercials where it's like they follow the person around and um, uh, someone's climbing up the ladder and the ladder's tilting and it's for insurance purposes? Well, again, you can fall at any age, but sadly, seniors are more prone to falls and also more prone to breaking things when, when we do fall. Now, you also want to be safe outside your home. You know, I don't know if you guys remember back in January of 2019, there was a, quite a famous car accident and there was an SUV driven by a 97 year old gentleman and he was going down the road and there was a car coming in another direction and he hit it. And in that car was a mom, two women and a child. And thankfully, nobody was hurt. But that older gentleman was Prince Charles and now sadly, or Prince Charles, well, he would not like that, Prince Philip. Um, sadly, Prince Philip has now passed away, but that, that episode really shook him up because up until then, up until 97, he was basically driving all the time on his own. And, you know, after that, he, it shook him up enough and he did give up his driver's license. I mean, many say that um, that was probably at the strong encouragement of the Queen that he give up his driver's license. But, you know, it's a really touchy subject. When seniors lose their driver's license or have to give them up, I know um, uh, someone has a stroke, well, automatically uh, doctors have to alert uh, the government and your driver's license is revoked. But it means for some a real loss of independence. And we all know as we get older, we're way smarter than we were, let's say, when we were 16, 17, 18 and got our driver's license. But we may not be as, um, I'll use the word sharp, but you know, we might not be as cognitively as quick or able to assess a situation very quickly when you have to make a split second decision, especially when you're driving in big cities and are going into on ramps and things like that. And also too, many drivers um, actually are, are taking medications. And it's, it's really fascinating that many doctors don't actually have a conversation with their patients saying, okay, here's all your different medications. Here's how it might affect your ability to drive uh, and make split decisions. It's almost like you're driving impaired, but you know, more often than not, it's not discussed with doctors. I know in my family situation, it was never discussed that, oh my gosh, you're taking 12 medications mixed together. You know, one by one, they're saving your life, but mixed together, you might not be able to make a quick decision on a highway. And sadly, more seniors have died in traffic fatalities in Canada uh, over the past several years. And, the, you know, when have you heard about that on the news? Not too often. But there's things you can do. I mean, there's driver safety programs. In many provinces, they, they do. Once you hit a certain age, they make you ask you questions or reapply for your driver's license. Um, my neighbor, she passed away in her home when she was 98 years old and she drove till she was 96. And every time I would hear that garage door go up, I would say, oh, Beth is on her way out again. But she just stayed around Sydney and, and she did very well. But you know, again, it um, it can get pretty tricky and it, it would be very sad to have an accident and that might be the catalyst that would take you out of your home. Okay, so now we talked about how we can be safe at home and while we're driving, let's talk about health. So, you know, our brain, it's this three pound of mass and tissue, but it is such a complex instrument that we have and we don't harness one hundredth the power of our brain. There's over a hundred billion nerve cells and all these things are linked and work together and they're they're really quite fascinating. But if those links and connections start to break down, we can have problems. You know, things like Alzheimer's disease. You know, Alzheimer's disease affects, you know, close to a million Canadians uh, currently. And of course, um, 
you know, there's young cases of Alzheimer's, but advancing age is the greatest risk for Alzheimer's. In fact, once you're over the age of 65, the risk of developing Alzheimer's doubles about every five years. And at this point in time, there's not a cure or really even a disease modifying drug. And, you know, a diagnosis for Alzheimer's for many people feels like a diagnosis of a, a terminal illness. And uh, it can create anxiety for the, the patient and their families because they, they fear what's to come. But, you know, this is not all doom and gloom. There is some good news. Do things to help your brain health. And this is not going to be a lecture of do this, don't do this, but there are just things that you can do to, you know, if you're prone to Alzheimer's or if you fear it, you know, take some matters into your own hands. If you smoke, try to butt out. Uh, reducing stress, you know, and whether that's yoga or meditation or walking your dog, whatever helps ease your stress load. Managing your weight and your cholesterol, so making sure you know your numbers and um, keeping that intact. Keeping your blood pressure low, that will help reduce the risk of cognitive impairment uh, and not just Alzheimer's, but any kind of dementia. And then protect your head, you know, whether it's uh, you're wearing a seatbelt or if you're riding your bike, use a helmet because head injuries can lead to not just Alzheimer's, but um, things like stroke when you bang your head. Exercise increases blood surprise, supply, it can help your memory and it can help improve your mood. And things like, you know, I'm doing crossword puzzles or I even myself, I signed up for Luminosity and there's exercises each day that they send me and it's kind of fun, it's interactive and as you start doing more, you are actually training your brain. Um, also doing things like some people decide to learn a new language or they try to do things with their opposite hand, anything that's actually exercising your brain. Being connected, you know, finding, and I know we're still in COVID, but we're coming out of it, finding activities that involve others and having fun, having fun and laughing is good for the brain. And also finding a purpose, you know, believing that your life has some purpose significantly reduces the risk of Alzheimer's. And this is a big one, getting adequate sleep, because poor sleep can lead to not just physical deterioration, but also memory loss. I know myself, if I have nights where I don't sleep well, I may as well, I, I feel like I'm, well, if I was I maybe had too much to drink or I just feel uh, like I'm in a fog. You know, sleep is not a luxury. Um, it can increase your risk for so many things, you know, obesity, memory issues, impaired judgment. You know, again, when you're driving on no sleep, that could be the same as if you've had a, two, a couple of cocktails and it can have a negative impact on your heart. So even a single night of sleep deprivation, that's why, you know, I feel, you know, so bad for you, for young mums that, you know, go nights and nights and nights without sleep. And they just, you know, that feeling of overwhelmed, you know, things um, seem so much worse when you haven't had a good sleep. And uh, again, it can be a contributor to Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, here's Yogi Berra weighing in, you know, I usually take a two hour nap from one to four every day and never feel guilty. If you can take a nap and recharge yourself um, and still fall asleep at night, I highly recommend it. And then our body, healthy body equals healthy mind. You know, there is, we know there's um, a correlation between what we put into our bodies and how our brains work. I mean, that's been proven so often in children in school, those who um, have a healthy breakfast uh, or consistent meals and how they perform. And again, Canada's food guide, you know, you can follow that or the diet of your choice. Again, for this, this is not a lecture of what you should and should not eat, but you know, get off the sofas, you know, the solid fats and added sugar, you know, that might be a good place to start in improving your diet. You know, and old Popeye, he had the right idea. He just had the wrong body, body part. You know, spinach or other leafy green vegetables. Rush University um, did, a, did a project and they found that people who consumed uh, the most leafy green vegetables were cognitively 11 years younger. Now, what they didn't say and what information I don't have was how many bloody greens did they have to eat for that? I'm not sure. 
And then there's Columbia University who um, also did a study and said seniors that adhere to that Mediterranean type diet, um, you know, with like good fats and olive oils. I'm hoping that that includes the wine too, but they and had some physical activity, had lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And Yogi weighs in again, you better cut the pizza in four slices because I'm not hungry enough to eat six. That sounds like my husband. Uh, now, let's talk about being alert because since the beginning of time, humans have kind of figured out that it's easier to steal something than from another individual than to get it for yourself. So back in the caveman days, that might have been stealing, I don't know, a piece of your antelope, but today it could be your credit card number. And with just a few clicks and keystrokes, uh, someone can take advantage of you and take thousands of dollars from your credit card. They could scare you into sending money. Someone might call you on the phone or come to the door with a scam. And in 2020 alone, there were over 68,000 fraud reports in Canada, resulting in losses of over $106 million. And I would be remiss if, um, Oh, I'll get to that in a second because I'll, I'll just go through the five costliest frauds currently affecting Canadians. Number one, romance scams. I'm sure you've heard of them. I mean, even Dr. Phil has done several episodes where people are just giving strangers their money and, you know, at the, at the cost of leaving money for their families because they've fallen in love. And during times of COVID, these things have been rampant because people are lonely and they've been isolated. Investment scams, then sphere phishing. That's when you get an email. Um, I almost got caught on one the other day where it looks so real that you think it's come from somewhere like Amazon or Apple and they have the logos and then you click on it and it's, it's a scam. Um, or something that comes from CRA saying that you owe them money and it looks so real. These guys are really good. Extortion, trying to get money out of you. This uh, actually happened to one of my clients, an advisor on the island, um, where he got an email saying that they had pictures and information on him and they had part of his password, send money or else. Well, he knew it was a scam because what they were accusing of, he hadn't done, thank goodness. And then merchandising scams. And during COVID, so from March of last year to the end of January, over $7 million was lost in Canada to COVID scams. So that could be things like fake test kits, um, fake vaccines, or a snake oil salesman saying, you know, here's the magic pill, you take this and, you know, you won't get COVID. And this little black book of scams, I absolutely love it. And the Competition Bureau of Canada put this together because the scams that I mentioned, the top ones, are just scratching the surface of what is out there. And this is a fun little book and it's free. You can download it. And it talks about all the different common scams, how to recognize them and how to report them. And it's, you know, prevention, the best prevention is awareness. Just know what's going on. I remember, you know, especially for seniors, you know, a few years ago, I asked my parents to invite some of their friends to a round table discussion over breakfast. And I, I asked them, how many of you feel or know that you've been um, either a victim or a potential victim of one of these type of scams. And every single one of them, you know, whether it's a phone call saying that your credit card's overdue, send payment now via gift card. I mean, there's so many, it's just mind boggling, but every single one of them have been subject to something like this. So make yourself aware of what's going on out there. And these guys, again, they're tricky, really tricky because very often they create a sense of emergency, They'll prey on people's emotions saying, you know, if you don't, you know, say yes now or sign up now, another child will die. They'll request personal information like just give me your in social insurance number or your password. They can threaten you. You know, that's that extortion type of thing. And very often they demand immediate payment, you know, cash, money order, preloaded gift cards. Like you see this on the news all the time when, um, uh, they're doing that piece like on, on Global National where um, these scam artists and they're they're asking for payments and gift cards. Now, kind of a red, red flag, but think about many people who are seniors who don't cognitively can't make a decision and rationalize that this might be wrong. So it's an unfortunate reality that we live in and it's it's actually ramped up during COVID. 
So I want to tell you about a real story. Um, unfortunately, it is a true story. So Janet, who's 84 years old. Now Janet's fairly typical. She's 84. She lives alone. She doesn't have children. She's a widow. She's not really technical tech savvy. She doesn't. She's not on the computer. She has no debt. Uh, just lives very modestly. Now Janet has and had early onset dementia, so it's not Alzheimer's. She's still able to function on her own, but this is likely going to worsen over time. So Janet has befriended her neighbor, Mark, who was 50, and he started helping her with little errands and odd jobs around the house. So not unusual. But then Mark decided to talk Janet into keeping all of her bank books at his house. So he said, you know, make me a power of attorney and I will look after all your finances. You know, I'm doing things around the house. Why not let me do things uh, to help you with your bank accounts as well? So she did, but then for whatever reason, she wasn't feeling good about it. So she asked for them back, but he wouldn't give them back. So she did reach out to a niece for help and the red flags went off. So uh, they went to the bank and uh, there was, <clears throat> pardon me, definitely something there. So they called the police. Unfortunately, Mark um, had defrauded Janet out of about $136,000. He used her bank books. He set up email accounts. He was doing online shopping, um, banking, doing e-transfers from her to himself. And he was convicted last year and he's sentenced to two years in prison. I think that's just a slap on the wrist, but at least he was caught. You know, so you also have to be alert to like um, family or caregivers. You know, be be suspicious if someone starts, you know, demanding access to your banking accounts or investment accounts or maybe suggest that you take out another mortgage on your house. Why would you do that? Or asking you to co-sign a loan or pressuring you to sign change your will or power of attorneys or, you know, that person who's always seeming to borrow money. You know, and there there's ways to hold this up, you know, one way, you know, open communication hold a family meeting and make sure that everybody knows what your wishes are um, on how you want to live out your life or how you want to get help with managing your affairs, uh, designating a trusted contact for finances and investments, and you know, don't sign any documents before you check with a lawyer or your financial professional. And very often a trusted contact would be someone like Viola, you know, your financial professional. So that's your, your go-to person for yourself and for family. So in that case, Viola, of course, would need to know your wishes. All right, resilience. You know, resilience is a word that we've all heard a lot in the last year because living through this pandemic and having to adapt to a, a different way of life um, hopefully for a short term, has shown us what it's like to be resilient. So it, it's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity or stress. Now, Mickey Rooney and Brooke Astor, two very different people, but they do have a lot in common. You know, sadly, both of these people were victims of elder abuse. Now, we've all heard of Mickey Rooney. I mean, he had an eight decade career, you know, in rate, um, you know, Broadway and radio and acting, and he made so many movies, so acquired a lot of wealth. Now, Mickey Rooney was also famous. He had a lot of marriages and a lot of kids, and he had decided um, to appoint his stepson and his wife kind of as, uh, as guardians, as caregivers, and they took him to the cleaners. You know, uh, over a 10-year period, not only did they take a lot of his money, basically almost all of it, but they withheld medication and full on elder abuse. And when Mickey Rooney passed away in um, 2014, he died at the age of, of 93, his entire estate was worth $18,000. Absolute crime. You know, they did reach a settlement the year before he died, but it was never paid. So absolutely atrocious. And then Brooke Astor, well, she was a very, very renowned um, New York philanthropist and social life. She gave millions and millions of dollars away to charities and the arts. And, you know, she lived to 105 years old, but it was her grandson that actually filed a lawsuit for against his dad. So her 85 year old son who had taken millions from her. 
And again, he was actually sentenced to jail. Her son was, but he never served because about a week into it, his health took so ill. But again, they both died um, much less wealthy uh, than what they had achieved over their lifetime. And so elder abuse is it's about so much more than just money. It's, it's knowing, it's any knowing intentional or negligent act by a caregiver or any other person that causes harm or serious risk to a vulnerable adult. And unfortunately, one out of 10 elderly Canadians is a victim of abuse each year. And that number is likely much higher because many of these cases do not go report or do not get reported. And in a lot of instances, the abuser is a family member, such as a spouse or an adult child. And it doesn't discriminate by how much money you have or where you come from. And it comes in many forms, physical, financial, sexual, emotional, neglect, or right out stealing of possessions. And it's become such, um, I guess, more, more easily talked about more mainstream that um, there is now going to be June 15th will be now known as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. You know, many, many times these uh, victims of abuse suffer in silence. You know, why? Well, you know, they could not have the knowledge. Many don't even know that if money's being siphoned or they're afraid or they're embarrassed or they simply don't know where to go to turn for help. And it's also important to know, like for everybody, not just for yourself, but the warning signs. And, you know, one of the key things to look for is a change. Any kind of change in demeanor, um, patterns of behavior, uh, the way um, people look after their, their personal care. You know, suddenly if someone, you know, is usually so fastidious in their um, attire and the way they look, and then suddenly they're disheveled or, um, you know, any kind of change could mean that something is up. So no, no, there's subtle warning signs of possible trauma. And elder abuse is not going to stop on its own. Like whether it's a friend or a relative, it's really critical to speak up because very often, again, these, these victims will suffer in silence. Now, many think, you know, if I, if I call the police, um, I don't want to get my family member in trouble or they've threatened that if I do something, they'll put me into a home or very often if they've got some physical uh, impairments, they're relying on that caregiver or family member uh, for care. And, you know, shame is a big one. Many feel ashamed that a close family member could be abusing them. But if you suspect that abuse is occurring to someone that you know or a family member, you know, first of all, try to talk to that elder alone. Try to try to draw them out to, to find out what's happening. But there's also a lot of um, avenues that you can explore. Uh, serious enough, the police, of course, if you want to report something anonymously, Crime Stoppers. Uh, there is a public trustee, but very often they're a government agency. They're so backed up that, you know, it might be too late by the time they um, they get to it. So just be aware, a lot of people think that you have to have conclusive evidence that abuse is taking place, and that is not correct. You just have to have a suspicion or a reasonable um, uh, a reasonable idea uh, that this might be happening to report it. And, you know, for people as we age, it's really critical, and I know it's been hard because of COVID, to stay socially engaged. You know, visiting with friends or volunteering, um, you know, getting out on trips, just doing anything helps with cognitive function. You know, and low social engagement has really been associated with the increased risk of dementia. And that, you know, for people in care facilities, especially that have been isolated during COVID, you often hear it's like, oh, well, they went they went downhill. And very often that's because they weren't able to stay socially connected. Now, you know, thankfully to technology, people, um, you know, have more access to stay connected, at least virtually. But, you know, being able, a lot of seniors too, you know, they've lost friends and they feel very alone or a spouse, especially. Um, so trying to find ways, and for some people, it's just not natural. I get it that, you know, you weren't a joiner, you didn't belong to things or you weren't a volunteer, but there are so many different ways now. And if you have an interest to find people, that have similar interests. And, you know, circling back to elder abuse, unfortunately, being socially isolated makes abuse three times more likely to happen. 
Now, I found this very timely today. So we all know this, you know, I get by with a little help from my friends. And I was watching the news this morning, and this is the 54th anniversary of when this album, uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, was uh, recorded today. So how timely. Well done, Viola. You must have planned it around that. Um, again, social isolation and loneliness. We need friends. We need people in our lives. You know, everything from heart problems to Alzheimer's to diabetes to stroke. Um, we've even seen it in young people over this last year of being isolated and lonely have been linked to many, many other health problems. So it's not just um, as we age, it can happen to us, any of us at any age. You know, in fact, loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So, um, you know, and as I said, we know COVID's been difficult, but we have things like this. So Zoom and webinars and um, people doing seminars like this, um, we can still be at least connected. Nothing will take the place of face to face, but at least it's something. And my favorite, you know, if you can't be with one you love, adopt the one you're with. You know, have I'm sure you've heard. I mean, it's, it's cats have been sold out everywhere. Dogs, um, some is a two year wait list if you need a particular one. But so much of the feedback, you know, it's yes, it's not a person, but it's it's a purpose. It's something to care for and to walk with um, getting people out of the house, um, helping you cope with stress or anxiety. For many people, it's helping them enjoy their lives. Um, again, I live in Sydney where I think everybody has a dog. It, it feels that way sometimes, including myself. And I often wonder, you know, it's it's so nice to be able to see seniors being able to have pets in their home. And what's really nice too is their charities that, that help with that so they can keep the pet um, and help them with vet care and all the things that go along with keeping a pet. But um, I highly recommend it. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is being prepared. You know, a lot of times many people who are married and couples, they, they think, oh, well, you know, my spouse will just look after everything. But you got to worry about the spouse, like who's going to look after that? That's really um, where the issue lies. And as Yogi says, always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. Franklin Templeton, we, we do these surveys every so often and we ask Canadians, so what, if any, plans have you made if you're no longer able to manage your affairs or finances? And one in three had not of us have not even thought about it at all. Now, those who had more investable assets or more money saved had thought about it, but still 55, the actual number is 55% of Canadians have not even given it a thought. And this, again, can happen at any age. You know, we often think about not being able to manage affairs is with cognitive issues, so that's when you're older. But this could be, you know, a 30-year-old going skiing, wax their head, they're in a coma, and now they're mentally incapacitated. So who's going to manage their affairs? So you need to do some things, you know. Take an inventory of all your assets. Make sure that your beneficiary designations are up to date and still valid and review your wishes um, you know, with Viola, like make sure an estate planning professional knows exactly uh, how you want things to do. So Viola or your um, will and estate lawyer, very important. And then create a plan because it's not just about when you pass away, it's about what happens if you are incapacitated, you're in a coma or you suddenly have an illness. How or who do you want to pay your bills and manage things while you are in that state. A few years ago, I was doing a, a women's seminar and we were all just going around talking about um, what keeps you up when you wake up at three o'clock, what's keeping you awake. And this one lady, she had the most unique answer. She was a, a business owner and she said, what keeps me awake the most is that I'm gonna get in an accident. I'm gonna be in a coma, I'm not gonna die. But when I wake up, my husband is going to have messed up and I'm going to have lost my entire business. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Um, there's things you can do, of course, leave little sticky notes around for just in case. But that wasn't a case of I'm afraid of dying and what's going to happen. I'm afraid of just being injured for a while and then things um, go to heck in a handbasket while I'm in a coma. 
you know, so share your wishes uh, with family members and make sure everybody's, you know, kind of set on things to avoid, you know, these disagreements, because trust me, very rarely do family things dealing with um, estates and care and all of that go smoothly. I speak from experience. Um, you know, make sure you put these things in a safe place and make sure people know where to find them. Don't make it an Easter egg hunt if something happens. Um, I, I was speaking to another group of women and the one lady, she was very, very afraid to say something, but she said, I've heard that the best place to put all my documents is in the deep freeze. And she was instantly berated by another lady. And I said, you know, that's a fantastic idea. You've put it in a baggie, put a little sticky on your freezer, just open up all your designations. So I think that's easier than a safety deposit box. I mean, nothing's off limits, but you know, I think even more importantly, what about end of life wishes? What about if you are on life support? What if like, what if you want a DNR, do not resuscitate, but the person looking after you says, oh no, I, I think this is what they would want. You need to be very specific. Um, you know, and, and there are like powers of attorney, but there's also medical directives that are kind of like a power of attorney. They govern your physical well-being. Um, so you need to look in as there. So, you know, your will, your beneficiary designations, power of attorney, and who's going to look after your medical needs or make those medical decisions if you are not able to. And finally, let's talk about technology. Like the future for aging with dignity is looking pretty good, you know, much better than uh, let's say our grandparents or great grandparents had it, you know, so you don't drive anymore. Well, we've got driverless cars and taxis that might be on their way. Now you might not want to be the one testing one of these out, but they're out there. It's coming. You know, we only hear about the ones that get into car accidents, but I, I, that is not the norm. Uh, you've heard of nanotechnology, nanotechnology. So there's smart devices and even things that can be woven into the fabric of clothing that allow your vital signs to be communicated directly with your doctor. You know, so you don't always have to be going in for doctor's appointments. Uh, smart homes, you know, that are can alert your caregiver. I mean, how cool is this? You know, mom's home, you know, you're looking after mom or caring for her or she's still living on her own. You have this type of technology. And then interactive devices have made it much easier for uh, everybody to stay connected and communicated. And voice activated robots. Um, you know, in, there's a hospital in I think it's Vienna or Amsterdam. Anyway, um, Francesca is her name. And she goes around and the bottom of her cleans the floors, but the top of her goes and visits with patients. She does karaoke, she tells jokes, uh, administers some medications. So I think it would be cool because I plan to live in my home forever to have my own robot that cleans and cooks and then also can do karaoke, of course. And the breakthroughs with medication, um, you know, the future has come to us faster than we ever expected. And part of the reason that we got the vaccine so quickly is, well, number one, they've been working on them for a decade, that type of technology, but also too, these breakthroughs in um, genomics uh, and DNA sequencing, which used to be so astronomically unaffordable. Um, let's say a strand cost a hundred million. Now that strand costs less than a thousand dollars. But what they're able to do is make more targeted treatments and therapies and medications based on your personal DNA. And those same type of advances are happening in dementia as well. And because we're all getting older, we're all living longer. So the upside is we're all living longer, but we need to be able to live longer, healthier. And that's just not physically because it's one thing to keep ourselves alive just by popping pills and all these medications to have quality of life. We have to have uh, a sound mind as well. So there's been a ton of research um, poured into development for dementia and Alzheimer's. Things like uh, non-invasive electrical stimulations of the brain um, have led to vast improvements in memory performance, as well as creating targeted medications, which are currently not available, but are in development for Alzheimer's. And then philanthropists like Bill Gates, um, 
might not be good, best husband, but he's uh, a significant donor uh, to Alzheimer's. And so just remember, you know, staying sharp is just not being, you know, sharp cognitively. It's being safe, being healthy, being alert, being resilient, and finally being prepared. And in the final words of Yogi, it ain't over till it's over. Thank you very much. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. So Viola, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jocelyn. That was just so informative and I think got us all doing a lot of thinking <laughs> and, and thinking about our preparations as far as what's what we're going to do to exercise our brain. But um, I know learning all this technology during COVID has certainly helped my brain stay active learning lots. Um, but does anybody out there have any questions for Jocelyn? You um, could certainly type them in the chat function. Um, we've got the question and answer um, little speech bubble that you can click on and type a question. Um, we'll just give it a moment in case anybody does. Well, it's questions or comments. You know, I'm also yeah. always curious to hear because, um, you know, especially when we talk about things like um, scams and all these different things that have gone on, you know, you, mm -hmm. I've learned over the last couple of years so many stories of people's personal experiences of what they've gone through or what a family member's gone through. Um, and some of them, you know, have happy endings and some are quite mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah, I had a client a few, just a few years ago, not that many years ago, she's passed away now, but she was the victim of fraud and it was someone somewhere in the US, um, you know, would have long patient conversations with her on the phone and she started withdrawing money to help her friend. Yeah. And I asked her, you know, when I asked her to show her my bank, her show me her bank books one day and it's like, well, what's with this, this big withdrawal here? Oh, well, um, my friend needed um, some help and spoke to her daughter and her daughter said, yeah, she's been the victim of fraud and the police are tracking it down but we she wouldn't admit to it for the longest time because she was obviously embarrassed but also felt that this per person was honestly her friend so um definitely it's happening in our own community and yep. have to be aware um doesn't appear that there's any questions or comments so um we'll wind it up uh, thank you so much, Jocelyn, and thank you to all of you who are attending this webinar live, but also to any of you that are watching it on replay and recording because we we will have it available. So if you're watching live and you would like to share it with a friend or family member, just let us know and we'll provide um, a link to it for you. And we will be putting it up on our website in the near future. Our website is um, being revamped at the moment. so. Um, once that process is finished, then it will be up there on the on the website. And um, I would just like to thank everyone who was involved behind the scenes here today. And um, that was Rachel Jamison, Annette Kwan, and um, we had Pauline and Kirsten from um, Jocelyn's team. And um, thank you all for making this a reality. And um, and. We just are thrilled to be able to continue to connect with you even during this um, crazy COVID time. So thank you much, very much, Jocelyn. Thank you. OK, and I'll do the 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 Zoom or webinar um, wave and we'll um, see you in the future on our next when we do our next webinar Wednesday. <laughs>